is there a better manager in the National League Central than Cincinnati's own David Bell? We're going to tell you. Also, the Reds' development staff is building superstars out in Goodyear. All that and more today on Locked on Reds. Let's go. You are Locked on Reds, your daily Cincinnati Reds podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. You are Locked On Reds with myself, Jeff Carr, alongside Stephen Offenbaker. We have done podcasts about the Reds for going on three years now, in fact, over three years, and remain quite addicted to Reds baseball. Locked On Reds is part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thanks for making us your first listen. We are free and available on all platforms on today's podcast we conclude our chat with charlie goldsmith and goodyear but before we get into that steve we've got to talk about david bell and his spot amongst nl central managers this question's a little bit harder than i thought it was going to be jeff as i've really sat down and looked at this division i think that uh, I'm just going to approach it honestly. Uh, if we're talking about the best manager in this division, I think that it's Craig Council in Milwaukee. I think that he's not only the best manager in this division, he's probably one of the better managers in baseball. I yeah. think that he does a great job handling that team up there uh, with a limited amount of resources a lot of times, and he gets the most out of those players. I think, uh, I think we start with him. Then when you get to next in line, I think it really becomes a, uh, an interesting conversation between David Bell and David Ross. I think the Davids come next. And for me, when you look at David Bell, uh, he's doing the best with what he's got. You know, people last year talked about his bullpen usage and the pitchers that he was running out there. But I mean to tell you, uh, he has to work with whoever Nick Crawl puts on that <laughs> roster. So if all of you've got down there is Amir Garrett and Heath Hembree, one of them is going to pitch. And that's just the way it is. So I think he did a good job with doing the best with what he had. And each of the seasons that David Bell has been in Cincinnati, my impression of his in-game management and his decision-making is that it has gotten better each year, that he is evolving each season that he's been here. And I'd, I'd be interested to hear your take on that because I really do feel like he is improving and is a work in progress. I think it's interesting because who would you say is the best manager in Reds franchise history? Well, that's a tough one. Everybody says Sparky, but he had a lineup stacked with Hall of Famers. I mean, he did a great job managing egos, but I'm not so sure that, you know, he did something that was unexpected. I, I for my money, who, Lou Pinella is probably yeah. one of the one of the better managers that's ever rolled through here. And Davy and, Johnson. And one and done, too, with that. I, I think it's interesting, though, because you made the point when it comes to Sparky. And you know who's the first person that's going to make that point? Sparky. He did on multiple occasions. He's like, I got to manage the grade eight, man. I got to manage the big red machine. What do you think it was? It wasn't. I mean, it, you know, still managing a baseball team, but it's not like he had it hard. David Bell was handed, you know, a couple of sticks and maybe a broken pipe and a car with two wheels and said, here's your bullpen. There you go. Don't forget the, don't forget the bubble gum Bob and the, bu yeah, the used, for bubble gum, the used bubble gum with tape that he pulled off of a carpet somewhere. Yeah. I, uh, I, I look at David Bell and I think that there's still more that he can show us. I think what we know about him doesn't necessarily make me believe that he's the best manager in the division. In fact, you can make the argument. He's not even the best David who is a manager in this division. And David Ross has a pretty good argument there too in Chicago, but I think that he has an ability to at least see the game through multiple viewpoints. He's coming off of a guy who didn't, a guy who didn't want to see that. And Jim Riggleman, say what you will about Jim Riggleman, he was a one dimensional manager. He understood the game through an old timer's lens no pun intended at all. I think that when you look at David Bell and what he does, the biggest pro that you can make an argument for David Bell is something that we fans don't see, but it's written about on the regular. See, Trent makes a, makes a point to really kind of not really hit this point when it comes to David Bell. And that's that he is amazing with the clubhouse. He manages egos. He manages personalities. He brings them all together and he does so in a very nice way. Uh, 
you can say what you will about his win loss record. It's that's the easiest way to judge a manager, but I think you have to agree the talent that he has been given has been a 500 ball club. And what do you do with that? He hasn't really made it better, but he hasn't really made it worse. So I don't know that he's the best manager, but I don't think he's the worst one either. I mean, you have to sit back and look at for just a second that with that bullpen being as horrendous as it was last year, the Reds were in the playoff conversation for most of the season. They were, Mm -hmm. they were around, they hung in there. And I think to your point about him managing the clubhouse and what he does, it is very clear that he cares about his players and it's very clear that his players care, care about him and you know, nothing shows how much he cares more than some of the fire he demonstrates on the field when one of his players is in trouble with an umpire or when one of his players, you know, has a beef. I mean, look no further than him going right at Clint Hurdle's jawline in that brawl when, you know, the teams are battling in front of the Pirates dugout. I mean, you know, David Bell was ready to throw down and he had already been tossed from that game. So, I, you know, I like that fire. I like that passion. And as long as he continues to adapt and adjust and evolve, I think he's the right guy to manage this team right now. I, I really do. I think so too. And I think the, the knock that a lot of fans give him his propensity to mix up the lineup, let's say uh, his love of platoon players. We said it, he's probably the happiest guy in major league baseball that they instituted the designated hitter universally. But I think that overall, that's kind of a strength, too, because he is willing to admit whenever he needs to change things up. He's willing to admit whenever the data is telling him to do something else. He is not a guy that is going to roll out. Let's let's call it what we will. I love this dude. I love what he did for the Reds whenever he was here. But David Bell doesn't have a Corey Patterson that he rolls out there and hits lead off. <laughs> David Bell doesn't run Jerry Harrison out, which I get Jerry Harrison was pretty decent, but like, I I just think of some managers and their guys that they had, that they played and we're all just side-eyeing every single day that he's run out there. David Bell understands who's got the hot hand, which is what I look forward to in seeing like with third base, how Eugenio Suarez bounce backs, what my Mastakis does. And I'm just rolling over words now for some reason, but When I look at David Bell, I do not think I do not see a guy who is a narrow minded person. And I think that that is important to be a manager nowadays. Now, if you were to ask me to rank them one, two, three, four, five, I think it's three. I mean, Craig Council's number one. I think David Ross, number two, but I definitely think I'd take David Bell over Derek Shelton. And and I don't know anything about Oliver, Oliver Marmol in St. Louis, who is replacing Mike Schilt for whatever reason. So I I think I rate him above those two guys, but I think it's hard for me to sit here and say that he's higher than David Ross or, um, or definitely not Craig council. You know, I I think I agree with, we agree on number one, Craig council in Milwaukee, I think is the number one. I'm going to call the Dave as a statistical tie right now. And I would like to see what happens as this season unfolds. I think that, uh, I think they both have a lot of great qualities. I think they both do a good job with their ball clubs. And I don't think either one of them's really done anything to separate them from the other right now. I, I think True. we head into this next season and 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 let the let let the best manager win, so to speak. And then I agree with you. You know, Pittsburgh, Shelton and Pittsburgh, you know, bless his heart, as they say in the South, bless his heart being with that organization. And then St. Louis, um, you know, the new manager's being handed the keys to an expensive Cadillac right now. Let's see what he does with it. But until he does something with it, he, he he's dead last in the division. You know, he's a rookie. He's going to have to earn it as far as I'm concerned. Thanks They're for sure, Jeff. Up. If the Reds are, if the Reds are going to find success in 2022, David Bell is going to have to find ways to be creative. And as you alluded to maximize the offensive production with this lineup. And he's also going to have to be creative and find ways to hide the weak spots, which could be the bullpen, which could be the continued struggles to find an everyday shortstop. We're just going to have to wait and see but whatever is going to happen if the reds are going to be successful a lot of it's going to be on david bell's shoulders to figure out how to do the best with what he's given by nick crawl and this front office uh coming up after years of missing the boat the reds have finally figured things out on the development side in the minor leagues and if you want to figure out your snack game go grab a built bar built bar 
is one of those things that helps you finally stick to a diet. Built Bar is a protein bar that tastes like a candy bar. Uh, it's maybe even better than a candy bar. Built Bar makes it easier to stick to your New Year's resolutions. It makes it easier for you to stick to your diet goals because it tastes so good. You will want to eat it. It's unlike any other protein bar, uh, which can be chalky, they can be waxy, they can taste basically like you're taking a big drink out of a barrel from a chemical spill. But Built Bar is 100% real chocolate. It makes you want to eat healthy, uh, especially when you're into a diet and you're bored and you really just want to throw it all away to have a candy bar. Built Bar tastes better than that candy bar, 100% real chocolate and still has amazing health statistics. We're talking only 130 calories. We're talking just four grams of sugar. We're talking only four net carbs for you keto folks and jam packed with 17 grams of po protein, not propane, protein, 17 grams of protein folks <laughs> with flavors like cherry barcia, which is my personal favorite, as well as coconut brownie chunks, salted caramel, and many, many other flavors. There's lots of puff flavors out there right now that, that Jeff absolutely drools over when he's talking to you about this, this product. It, it, they're amazing. Head over to built.com right now and use the promo code locked 15. You're going to get 15% off your next order, and that's going to get you started on your new goal of being healthy and still being happy while you're doing it. Head over to built.com, use the promo code LOCKED15 for your 15% off of Built Bar. Make sure you give the Locked On MLB Prospects podcast a listen after today's podcast. Lindsey Crosby is a minor league encyclopedia, and he will keep you up to date on the up and coming players in the minor leagues, as well as talk some college baseball as well. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you saw that Cincinnati Bearcats walk off against Ohio State, which hurt my heart, but it happened. And Lindsey Crosby will get into things just like that. The Locked On MLB Prospects podcast. It's just like Locked On Reds. It's free and available on all platforms. Make sure you're following us on Twitter at S Offenbaker, at Jeff Carr, that's Jeff with three F's, and at Locked On Reds. Also, subscribe to our YouTube channel at Locked On Reds. We're going to have a lot of exclusive content over there uh, that's not going to be released in the audio feed. So make sure you head over, click that subscribe button. On the next Locked on Reds, Jeff and I are going to continue to discuss the rankings of the Reds, this time their defense. We're going to see how their defense stacks up with the other teams in the National League Central. And for the rest of today's show, let's head back out to Goodyear, Arizona, where we finish our conversation with Reds beat writer Charlie Goldsmith. You mentioned Eric Davis being out there with the players. Is there any other uh, Reds alumni that's gone out to Goodyear to help the non 40 man guys? Yeah, so Davis works for the Reds. He's one of the special assistants to the general manager. Aside from him and aside from Corky, no one that I've recognized, um, certainly a lot of Reds, former Reds are on that front office directory. Sure. Um, no one specifically through those conversations I've had in spring have come up. Uh, but a, a lot of talented people in place, the pitching coordinators as well, Brian Conger and Casey Weathers. Casey played for Derek Johnson at Vanderbilt, brings a very unique perspective Conger as well. Um, I have been very impressed with, and, and I'll say this too, like the stuff I'm seeing them do now is the minor leaguers do now is the exact same stuff that I saw the Reds do last spring training and then do every day before and during batting practice during the regular season. It's nice. eerily familiar, the drills that they're doing. And I think that there's a very, and there's a very clear and distinct um, plan for player development from top to bottom. As you see with their Johnson's promotion, the connections with the catchers, as I was saying, a similar hitting approach as well. I think it's all very, I think that's been a focus for them over the last few years, the connected nature of the player development system. It's very interesting, Charlie. You Every time I interview you, you always just naturally segue to where I wanted to go next. And that was Derek Johnson's promotion as the overall pitching uh, guru, so to speak, the coordinator for the entire system. Uh, you know, he has been tasked with creating a consistent uh, method and uh, direction for the, the pitchers from top to bottom. Uh, do you see any differences um, other than what you just mentioned? Is, is he out there working with these guys? Is he out there working with the coaching staff? Uh, what are you seeing from this new role of Derek Johnson? Yeah, I haven't seen him here, but it's very because none of the major league coaches are here daily working with the, with the players, but it's very important to connect the vision he set like they literally had meetings this off season where they said, these are going to be the pillars of the Reds pitching development plan. And the first two big moves he made were hiring 
Brian Conger and Casey Weathers. And I think everything you want to know about the Reds plan, look at those two guys' paths in history. Brian Conger had a very long college coaching career, specifically at Tarleton State, which is a Division II program. You know, I know nothing about Tarleton State baseball before talking to Brian. And around 2018, you know, they had no funds. They had no resources. They had nothing. There no scholarships or very few scholarships. So it's crucial that you maximize your scholarship pitchers and keep those guys healthy. Around 2018, Conger becomes one of the first uh, pitching coaches to work with the modus sleeve, which tracks fatigue and torque and stuff like that, and comes up with a brand new way to use it and helps make Tarleton State one of the most healthy and most successful pitching staffs at that level. Casey Weathers was a guy who tried every sort of artistic, you know, development thing during his minor league playing career that didn't pan out. Eventually, that led him to his close friend, Caleb Cotham, who we know, and Drodron. And he was one of the first pitchers to use TrackMan. So here's the root there. Here's the common link. It's two people who had an approach to pitching that was based on, you know, relationships, development, stuff like that. And were willing to be the most forward thinkers in adapting their message to use the highest end technology. It's not just about the tech. It's using the tech Uh, evaluating the picture and what you're seeing, relaying that message. And I think, you know, they they had a wide search. The reason they liked Brian and Casey was because of their demonstrated experience at connecting, you know, Derek Johnson, his big tagline this offseason is the arts and the sciences, is connecting the arts and the human side of pitching that we see on such a tangible level, uh, connecting that with the sciences. The Reds continue to be one of the most, analytically and technologically savvy uh, organizations with how they use technology and pitching. And, you know, Casey and Brian's backgrounds that I mentioned, their background certainly lines up with that. The the marriage of the two is really the the stressing point that they've developed this offseason. Well, staying right there with that theme, then uh, one of the things we heard as, you know, analytics, as this new technology based way of coaching has made its way into the game. One of the things we've heard from some of the, you know, I don't know if old timers is fair, but some of the people that have been around a while, uh, one of the things that, you know, we've heard them say is that, you know, there will be ball players that will not embrace this philosophy. Mm-hmm. There will be ball players that are not going to respond well to this type of coaching. What have you seen from the pitchers in camp as far as their buy-in to this, what the Reds are trying to do? That's the crucial point. That's exactly what I forgot to mention. Um, I, and honestly, I forget which pitcher said this, but one pitcher said, you know, I'm not a big analytics and technology guy. And you need to be able to coach those pitchers just as well as you need to be coach. You need to coach Sonny Gray, who loves all this and talks about this all this, or Sean Doolittle, who's not with the Reds, but is known for around Major League Baseball for his embrace, his embracing of that style of development. Um, and again, that's that's important too. That it's not just one way of uh, of developing the pitcher. And here's the other key point as well. The play, it's very much a player driven process to where Derek Johnson's number one, not cliche, but number one talking point for the last 40 years has been be great at what you're good at. You guys have heard that, right? Oh, yeah. That yeah. is guiding this entire philosophy, identifying unique strengths and the unique vision of each individual on the staff and relying on that really to lead that development. And one of the, one of the pitching coaches said this to me. If you're telling a player to do something, you're not as bought in on their career as they are. No one will be more bought in on a player's baseball career than that player themselves. So they have to be completely not just bought in, but leading the process in their development. Your job is to be as transparent as possible and to provide as much tools and resources, whether it's technology or traditional coaching, for that to be able to happen. But in a player-driven approach, you can get even greater success. And so this isn't an organization that's telling every kid in double A to develop a change up. It's the organization that's doing the opposite of that. And, you know, you can point to a lot of success stories over the last couple of years where that model has paid off and with a kind of tweaked approach this season, I'm very interested to see what happens. There are multiple faces currently in Goodyear that are poised to make an impact for the Reds this season. We dive into who next. 
Before we talk about that, though, I want to tell you about BetOnline.net. BetOnline's got some interesting odds when it comes to the start of the regular season. In fact, if you're looking at the month of May, like I said, and probably being a little bit optimistic about it, the odds are currently seven to four. If you've got June, like Steve said, it's the odds are two to one. There's actually uh, better odds for the month of July than there is for the month of April. That tells you what Vegas is thinking about the current lockout situation. And if you're talking about how many games are going to be in this 2022 regular season, the over-under is currently at 120 and a half games. You can pick over-under whether or not you want to do that. That's all at Bet Online. Bet Online is the best spot for all of your sports news and scores during uh, the many seasons that are going on. Currently, we are right in the throes of conference championship season. Yeah, I know some of it, it's really more like mid-major stuff that's going on right now, but Bet Online's got you covered for all of the NCAA basketball action. As we head into March Madness, plus you can find NBA stuff there, NHL, boxing and UFC. Pretty big fight this weekend between Colby Covington and Jorge Masvidal. You're going to get all you want to know and more at betonline.net about that fight. Check it out today. BetOnline.net. They've got everything and some amazing offers for uh, the 2022 season, whether you're talking about basketball, hockey or whatever, as as we whatever get close to maybe 2022 baseball we'll see bet online is where the game starts thanks again for making locked on reds your first listen of the day we are free and available on all platforms all right let's head back to goodyear and charlie goldsmith as we talk about some faces who are currently in goodyear who aren't on the 40-man roster who are going to make an impact on the reds this year Going to play a quick game because I think we all okay. expect at some point to see Nick Lodolo mm-hmm. at Great American Ballpark. Who else will we see out of the group that you are currently watching? Great question. Um, I'm looking at my depth, or my depth chart, but the list of players I have right now. I think we'll see Andrew Knapp. Oh, Jake, yep. Bauer, Jake Bowers is interesting. Um, I was going through it today, like what, what his role could be. It would all go back to him being a DH against – uh, right-handed or it's left-handed pitchers. Um, but then like a Matt do? Davidson type guy, but then it, you might need an expanded roster because what if like mm. stock is, is your full-time DH they'll have a decision to make there. And the roster mat there is very interesting. And I look forward to getting there once the year starts, but Bowers is certainly a candidate. Um, going through my list, Ronnie Dawson, their uh, rule, their minor league rule five draft pick. Uh, he's an outfielder, can play all three positions. Lefty has some nice, like some nice pop, some nice tools, some nice, nice athleticism. Very much like a Mark Payton style of role, you could see where he's a minor league guy who, if injuries hit, could come up and fill depth in the organization. You could say, say the same thing about Lorenzo Cedrola. He hit like 320 in double A last year, finished the year in triple A. Speed, contact, center field. He's certainly in that depth outfield mix as well. Uh, Lodolo, Graham Ashcraft, certainly interesting. I think the expectation is that he could definitely spend a ton of time in AAA this season. And, and you all know how injuries in AAA for starting pitchers work. You know, you can only have so many guys before it's your turn called. If he develops at anywhere near the pace he developed last season, he could certainly be in the mix. And then the big one, the bullpen. Um, how many guys do they need from AAA and how many of those guys are uh, here now? Certainly Trey Wingetner. Uh, a guy they brought in six, seven, big breaking ball, big frame power pitcher, Connor Overton, kind of a guy who can fill a hybrid utility role in the bullpen, Philip Deal, uh, Joe Kunal as well. People sleep on him because he mm-hmm. missed the entire 2021 season, most of the 2021 season with a shoulder injury. They say he's back right where he was at 2019 when he was one of the fastest rising relief pitchers in the organization. So that's a long answer, but like, I, I don't have this list in front of me, but the guys who were at this camp last year, They had like an extended minor league spring training that kind of bled into the big league spring training. You had India, Lopez, Colzvari, San Martin, Gutierrez, Centian. You had a bunch of guys there. There were like eight or nine who ended up playing for the Reds that season. And certainly, you know, you could see injuries pop up more this season because of its uh, unique season. Um, Certainly a number of these guys will play for the Reds at some point. I wonder what we'll see out of Matt McClain too, because I think of him as – almost not not a safety guy but like you keep hearing the words high floor with him 
And, and you've got a situation where shortstop might be kind of a fluid conversation, depending on how injuries play out and how performances play out and things like that. He could be an interesting guy. I think what, what's kind of been the word around camp about him. Yep, lots of conversation about Matt McClain and kind of the cliche is to say shades of Jonathan India. There is a certain pedigree you develop when you were the shortstop at UCLA or the third baseman at Florida. And you have that kind of approach at the plate that a guy like McLean has, like the word baseball rat was used. And I have a story on McLean coming out later this week and baseball rat will be in the headline that, <laughs> that, that pure polish in terms of plate discipline, pitch recognition, um, poise, confidence at the plate that you see um, versatility as well. Like the Reds, look at their top prospect or look at the prospects who are here right now. You have McLean, De La Cruz, Torres, plus Barrero above him, all shortstops in that pipeline. The Reds, and then look at their outfield prospects. They're aside from Hendrick and now Hines, they're basically all center fielders. The Reds are adding up the middle and believing that if the bat plays and they draft a guy so they believe the bat will play, then you can move them off because those are the best athletes you have in your system. Like the Reds have that type of guy, and McLean certainly falls into that camp as a standout um, really great athlete as well. So again, he has the tools, the polish, the pedigree to be a quick riser. Now the India comparison is interesting. We can talk about timeline because India would have been called up in 2020 had he been healthy. I think it was an oblique injury he had in September. Um, he was drafted in 2018. McLean was drafted in 21. So if he follows that same track, you could say 23. Every player is different. McLean, of course, we've seen many players make the jump from double A to the majors in one season. And one last point on him, he might be the furthest along player in terms of where they are in terms of developing close to the big leagues of any player on their top 30 prospect list. Like you look at maybe him and Mike Ciani as the guys closest to the big leagues who are here right now. Um, you know, Hein Hendrick Hines, De La Cruz, Nelson haven't played above a ball. So, you know, McLean is as fast of a riser as any position player here. No, I know we've I know we've taken a lot of your time and, and I'm just going to start throwing me the cut sign in a minute, but you know, you, this is great stuff. I really do appreciate it, Charlie. Um, with all those guys you just mentioned, when, when the, when the prospect list started coming out, Jeff and I did a whole episode on, on these infielders in the, in the prospect rankings and trying to imagine how it is that you're going to get, you know, a lot of these guys hitting the major leagues at roughly the same time. And, you know, you talked about it them being very athletic and, you know, maybe following uh, the Chris Bryant model of playing multiple positions and, and moving around a lot. Are you seeing any of these guys work out in other places besides their primary position right now? That's a great point. And the answer is no. So there, there are fewer guys than you think. So the guys in minor league spring training right now, who you say is those up the middle versatile guys in the infield, because outfield's its own thing. They can play anywhere. Like you're Michael Ciani, Jay Allen, they can play right, left, or center. It doesn't really matter. Hines and Hendrick are both playing in right. Um, then you look at the rest of the position players. It's not really many prospects, just saying it respectfully. You know, the homegrown guys are Michael DeLeon, who's a versatile guy who played everywhere in Louisville last year. Uh, Robbie Tenorowitz, who did the same thing in Chattanooga. Miguel Hernandez, who did the same thing in Chattanooga. The three guys who long-term you're looking at their flexibility options in the infield, that's Matt McClain, Ellie De La Cruz, and Jose Torres. So far, I've only seen those guys take reps at shortstop with the exception Torres and De La Cruz did like half a day at third base a couple days ago. Uh, the Reds, here's what direct, farm director Sean Pender told me. If the pipeline wasn't so stacked, De La Cruz certainly is a natural at shortstop. But you've got to explore other options when you have Barrero and McLean and a number of guys who can play that position very well. Uh, so generally, no, you don't see guys moving around a lot. You might see that later in the spring. You might see that during the minor league season. But so far, I've only seen McLean at short and I've basically only seen De La Cruz and Torres at short. Well, Charlie, we appreciate you coming on and thank you for your time very much today. We got a lot of great stuff out of this. I know you mentioned that you've got a piece coming out about Matt McClain coming up. What else can we expect from you coming from Goodyear? Yeah, you know, all these top prospects, you name them, I'll write about them at some point. I have something up on Ellie De La Cruz and his one of a kind journey. I have something on Jay Allen that posted today, one of the most interesting prospect stories. Could have been a D1 football player, uh, pick baseball instead. I'll have something up on Reese Hines later in the week. Matt Nelson later in the week. Um, so stay tuned.
Well, that's going to wrap up this edition of Locked on Reds. Coming up on next week's podcast, Jeff and I will keep you updated on the continuing saga of the CBA negotiations. We also will continue to talk about the up-and-coming minor leaguers as they are working on getting ready for the season out in Goodyear. We'll also continue to rank where the Reds fit in the National League Central on defense, their lineup, and a lot of other things. So make sure you are subscribed so you don't miss any of that. Thank you so much for making Locked on Reds your first listen of the day. Now make Locked on MLB your second listen. Paul Francis Sullivan, please call him Sully, brings you his unique perspective on the major leagues, both past and present. Locked on MLB, just like Locked on Reds, is free and available on all platforms. It might still be the offseason, and we might still be locked out. But Jeff, what are we? We are Locked on Reds every single day.